go for a minute or two. So mm-hmm. um, I think let's, why don't you go on, Christy, whenever right. you're ready. Sounds we're good. Live on, we're live on YouTube now. Great. Thanks, Carlos. Everybody, thank you for joining us for our first uh, webinar of 2021 with the ACS Physical Chemistry Division. I'm Christy Landis, I'm at Rice University and our kind of ad hoc panel of people who have set this up are in order on my screen of, uh, we're very thankful to Rodrigo Noriega. He's an assistant professor at the University of Utah and Carlos Baez, who now is officially tenured. Yes, Carlos? Ish, ish, <laughs> at the University. Okay, so don't jinx it. At the University of Texas at Austin, and um, full professor and super big cheese, uh, Anne McCoy, our uh, outgoing chair of the physical chemistry division at ACS. And we're very honored to have um, our speaker, uh, Professor Michael Fair. And Anne is going to do a, a appropriate um, in, uh, introduction for Mike. But before we get started, I just want to point out how these are going to, uh, how this is going to run. And that is that if you can type your question into the chat feature of um, the function, then Rodrigo, Carlos, and Anne and I will be organizing your questions behind the scenes and we'll ask them uh, of Mike at the end. So we're gonna take all the questions at the end. And then after that, um, Professor Fayer has been very generous to offer to stay over a little bit and have um, a, a more intimate conversation with just the students and the postdocs where you'll get a chance to maybe ask some questions directly. And then um, before I turn it over to Anne, I want to share my, oh, no, I can't share my screen. What we're going to put in there is that the registration for the ACS meeting is live and on the interweb. So we are going to then maybe share the link to that in the chat function. So don't forget to register for the ACS meeting. Um, the deadline for that is coming up. And so I think that probably is the all of my um, intro stuff. And now we'll turn it over to Professor Anne McCoy, who's gonna do a formal introduction of Professor Fayer. Yes, thank you very much, Christy. And Christy is, I believe our vice chair elect for the Phys Division right now. Um, but I, I should also mention that we are grateful to Phase Tech for providing financial support for um, the, some, the series and basically has provided us with the resources to have the license to be able to have these large um, Zoom calls. So it's really my pleasure today to introduce today's um, PCHEM seminar speaker, um, who's Mike Fair from Stanford University. Mike, received both this um, bachelor's and PhD um, from Berkeley um, working under Charles Harris and then went directly to Stanford University where he rose through the ranks and is currently the um, David Ursham and Edward Curtis Franklin Professor of Chemistry. I think Mike is really best known for just his beautiful work in nonlinear spectroscopy techniques to study the dynamics of water, molecules, particularly water in a variety of environments. And he's gonna be telling us work um, in, that, um, in that domain today. But before I turn it over to him, Mike has received numerous awards. Um, he is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, um, Royal Society of Chemistry, Optical Society of America, um, as well as a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, he's also received numerous awards from various organizations, um, including the Bright Wilson Award in Spectroscopy from the ACS in 2007. Um, seven years later, the Ahmed Well Award in Ultravast Science and Technology from the ACS, and then um, the 2020 Peter Dubai Award in Physical Chemistry, which is really uh, the highest award in physical chemistry um, from the ACS. And today he's gonna to be telling us about work in monolayer dynamics at the air-water interface, both ultra-fast and ultra-slow. So Mike, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I look forward to your talk. Okay, so uh, it's a pleasure, I don't know quite how to say it, to be with you. <laughs> and uh, um, I wish we could all be here in person and I really wish we could you know, go back to having ACS meetings where we all can smooth and meet each other in the hallway. Because, you know, I, I, I hear a lot that, oh, people don't have to meet in person. They can just do everything by Zoom. But, you know, it's so much more fun and enjoyable uh, to be able to uh, 
run into people, have casual conversations, and this isn't the greatest venue for this. So what I'm going to do today is I, I'm going to tell you about uh, what water at a Langmuir monolayer interface on water looks like, but also what the monolayer does itself, which was quite surprising. But uh, in the process of that, I want to introduce in the middle of this thing, a method we developed just uh, fairly recently, which makes it possible to do beautiful nonlinear 2D IR and other nonlinear spectroscopies on monolayers in very, very thin films. And so the way this talk is going to go, I'm going to first uh, talk a little bit about bul what bulk water does and introduce you to 2D IR. And then after that, I'm going to sort of mention monolayers and the problem of trying to make a measurement on a system that has very, very few molecules. And after I show you how we overcame that, then we'll talk about water at the uh, air water interfaces. And now I have to go into the zoom mode. So I'll get my slides up here. We hope. Okay, so uh, we'll come back to this, but this is uh, from a simulation of water. At, uh, eh, here's the water, and this is a, a Langmuir monolayer on the surface of water. Okay, so what we wanna do is look at the water dynamics, and in the end, we'll end up also looking at the surfactant dynamics. And this was done with uh, you know, ultra-fast 2D IR spectroscopy. And um, how do we get information out of this? So, the idea is, so starting the first experiments I show you is just bulk water. Uh, there we use the hydroxyl stretch of the water, uh, the vibration of the hydroxyl stretch as the vibrational probe. And when you take a linear spectrum, an FTIR spectrum of, you know, basically any type of vibrational mode, you're in condensed phase, but actually, you know, anything, you're going to get an inhomogeneously broadened line. And what does it mean to have an inhomogeneously broadened line? What it basically means is that you've got a bunch of different environments. So in water, you've got all these different hydrogen bond configurations. And depending on the hydrogen bond configuration of a particular water molecule, that'll shift its frequency either to higher frequency or to lower frequency. So under this inhomogeneous line, there are re really many, many different environments giving rise to uh, individual sub ensembles of molecules that have particular frequencies. So this is represents one of those frequencies at time t equals zero. Uh, you've got this water molecule. It happens at time t equals zero to have this frequency, omega. And then the point is that, of course, water and all the systems we all are interested in in chemistry, chemistry is dynamic, so things change. So in water, you have all of these fluctuations, hydrogen bond rearrangements and so forth. And the net result is that this molecule that has this frequency omega at time t equals zero, as the water structure evolves, its frequency is gonna change. And so the frequency is going to wander around underneath the inhomogeneous line. And this is called spectral diffusion. And so the frequency changes because the structure changes. And the point is, if you can measure the time evolution of the frequency, then you've measured the time evolution of the structure because the frequency changes because the structure changes. Okay, so how do we do this? Uh, this is a standard uh, 2D IR pulse sequence and there are three pulses in and a fourth pulse out. This is a nonlinear experiment. You shoot three pulses into the sample and then this fourth pulse, the so-called vibrational echo comes out. Uh, the time between pulse one and two is tau, and the time between pulse two and three is TW, and then sometime after the third pulse, the echo comes out. So in the experiment, what you do is pulse one essentially labels the frequency of all the molecules at time t equals zero. So I showed you that one molecule, I said, okay, it has frequency omega but you basically hit all the molecules and you tag them and say, okay, at time t equals zero, this is your frequency. The second pulse stores that information. So it remains, you, can, you sort of 
trap the information. And then you wait some time, this time TW, W is for waiting. And during this time, the system will evolve. So if it's water, you know, you'll have fluctuations, hydrogen bonds will form and dissociate. Uh, and that's gonna change the frequency. The third pulse starts the readout. It initiates or stimulates the emission of this echo. And then it's this echo pulse that you detect. And so in the experiment for a fixed TW, you scan this pulse, the time between pulse one and two, and you get an interferogram, which doesn't look so great here. Actually, it's sort of aliased. It's too many points here. This has like a point every three femtoseconds in it. And you get this type of interferogram at every frequency in a, a, from an array detector that you have in a monochromator. You do two Fourier transforms, one of these interferograms, and one is the spectrum, where when you take a spectrum, you're basically doing a Fourier transform. And what you get is you get a 2D spectrum. And so this is from the zero to one transition. Uh, this is a nonlinear experiment. So you actually also see this is from the one to two transition. If you see this little funny thing here, that's the CO2 line. We try and purge CO2 out of the system. It's really hard to get all the CO2 out. So right there, that's the uh, 2350 absorption of CO2 messing this guy up. But we'll look at this guy. Okay, so once you get this, what you do is you change the time TW, the time between pulse one and two, I'm sorry, between pulse two and three, you scan pulse one and two again, and you get another, you do two Fourier transforms and you get another uh, 2D spectrum. And as you'll see, as time goes on, the shape of the 2D spectrum change. And the information is in the time dependent change in the shape of the 2D spectrum. And uh, I'll mention again later, but we've developed a very uh, robust method called the centerline slope method for quanti quantitatively taking the change in shape of these 2D spectra as you wait longer and longer, giving the system longer and longer for its structure to evolve and obtaining what's called the frequency frequency correlation function. So this is the thing that really describes the dynamics of the structural evolution of the system through the change in frequency. And uh, here it's normalized and normalized it, but basically you get a shape of this thing. It has time constants, it has amplitudes, and those are what give you the information on the frequency evolution, which is related to the structural evolution. Okay, so in water, of course, the thing that's so amazing about water is that it's a liquid at room temperature. You know, methane uh, has almost the same molecular weight, has almost the same size, but of course, it's a gas at room temperature. And if it's water's hydrogen bonds that make it different, this is my cartoon, and water generally makes four hydrogen bonds in a sort of quasi-tetrahedral arrangement. And uh, it's those hydrogen bond rearrangements that are responsible for water's ability to do so many things. I mean, water can solvate a folding protein as it changes. Water will dissolve ions when you dump you know, salt into water. And it's because water rapidly rearranges its hydrogen bonds and can reconfigure itself around whatever you've got, a protein, a salt, you know, sodium ions, chloride ion, whatever. So we use the hydroxyl stretch, but we actually put a little bit of HOD in H2O. And we do that because if you look at pure H2O, you get vibrational excitation transfer. This is just like electronic excitation transfer, Forster transfer, except the vibrational excitation will hop from one water molecule to another. And that hopping means you don't get the type of structural information you want. All you do is get information on the excitation hopping. So we put in a little bit of HOD, which doesn't change the water, and all sorts of simulations have shown you're still measuring all of the properties of water. And we look at the OD stretch. And when you do that, it's you have this very broad spectrum, and it's very broad because there's so many hydrogen bond configurations. Uh, on the blue side of the line, meaning the high frequency side, are weak hydrogen bonds. On the red side of the line is where you have strong hydrogen bonds. Water makes four hydrogen bonds, so there's lots of combinations of strong and weak among all those hydrogen bonds, giving you this very broad inhomogeneous line. 
And then we have a laser uh, IR system that can make very short pulses, so a big bandwidth, so you can hit uh, all of this spectrum and the one to two transition, which is shifted by the large anharmonicity. Okay, so this is the first 2D IR data uh, that worked on water. This was in 2004, quite a long time ago. And at this time, it was a tour de force to get these six points. It literally took us a couple of months to acquire the data, to get to the point where we could make good reproducible data, acquire this data, and then analyzing it at the time took a very, very long time. The computers were slow and we didn't have these very new methods, this centerline slope method for rapidly extracting the frequency frequency correlation function. But the thing I want you to look at here, even though there are only six points, uh, this is 100 femtoseconds, 400 femtoseconds, you can see how the shape of the spectrum changes quite dramatically as time goes on. So then you plot these points and from these points, you can get the frequency frequency correlation function. Well, we collaborated with the group of Jim Skinner at the University of Wisconsin. And so this blue line up here is from our data. That's the data. This is a, a semi log plot of the data. And Jim compared this, did lots of simulations. And I have to tell you, I don't have time to go into it. But at those times, all the simulations were uh, classical. You know, now you can do ab initio, uh, MD simulations, you know, quantum MD simulations. And Jim had to develop methods. How do you pull what is inherently a quantum mechanical uh, uh, observable? So here you can look at my hands. Remember, you got these vibrational level levels. And what we're looking at is the time evolution of this frequency of these quantized vibrational levels. So this is an intrinsically quantum mechanical, but Jim figured out and developed methods for pulling out uh, information out of classical simulations. And what you see is uh, he looked at many, many of the standard water models. Some of them work better and some of them work less well. They all work reasonably well in the sense that they, we can look or Jim can look into these things to say, okay, what are we measuring? When we measure the dynamics, this is what we see, we measure two time scales. There's a very fast time scale, which is 0.4 picoseconds. And what this is are very local motions. Uh, they're these hydrogen bond motions. So again, if you look up at me, what you have is you have, this is the hydroxyl, this is another water oxygen. On a very short time scale, you have hydrogen bond, mainly length, but also some uh, orientational fluctuations. So those hydrogen bond length fluctuations, they're not oscillations, they're fluctuations because all of the water molecules and hydrogen bond configurations are fluctuating. And that makes the particular one, the OD we're looking at, fluctuate in length. And that changes the frequency. And that happens on 0.4 picoseconds. And then on a longer time scale, 1.7 picoseconds, uh, what you get is complete hydrogen bond randomization. So you have this quasi tetrahedral, you know, almost tetrahedral hydrogen bonding network, and you get concerted rearrangement. What that means is a whole bunch of hydrogen bonds flip around at one time. And the reason why that is water hates not having hydrogen bonds. So in order to really rearrange the hydrogen bonds, a hydrogen bond breaks, but immediately it makes a new one on another water molecule and the hydrogen bonds, this one goes over there, this one comes over here and all these hydrogen bonds are in a concerted manner flip around. And so the randomization, the time for the water hydrogen bond network to randomize, that's two picoseconds. Okay, well, we ha it took us forever to get those six points. Now we can get lots and lots of points much, much faster. In fact, we use water to tune up our instrument when we wanna check that everything's working okay. Uh, our original results were correct, but now you know we can get a lot of points and we can get them much faster. And we use this center line slope method to analyze the data and pull out uh, uh, the frequency frequency correlation function. Okay. So now I want to talk to you about monolayers. I, I'm not going to talk to you about our first work. I just need to mention it to tell you how horrible it was, again, to do this. This is, we've studied uh, functionalized alkyl chain monolayers on SiO2 and on gold planar surfaces. 
And this again comes from a simulation of my colleague, Tom Markland, who we collaborated with to, you know, we can make the measurements, but it's great help to do simulations to understand what's going on at the molecular level. And the difficulty is, of course, that uh, you have very, very few molecules in a monolayer. So this is how, at the time, we were doing the experiments. This is called a boxcar configuration. You bring in three pulses, you know, with the time I showed you before, pulse one, pulse two, pulse three, and you bring those into the sample, and they all come in at different angles. And then due to wave vector matching, the vibrational echo takes off in a unique direction. And uh, in the very earliest experiments we did, way before this, we did the first experiments in the early 1990s using a free electron laser before there really were good IR sources. Uh, what we did was we would just detect the echo at the intensity level. But then what we started doing, and lots of people started doing, was to heterodyne detect. And so you have to combine this echo with another pulse. So three pulses go in, the fourth pulse goes out, a fifth pulse, which is the local oscillators combined spatially and temporally, and then that goes into a monochrometer. And it's when you scan the time between pulse one and two, the echo moves across the electric field. The echo electric field moves across the electric field of the local oscillator. And that's what gives you that interferogram I showed you before. The monochrometer gives you another Fourier transform. The key thing here is the signal is this cross term. It's as you scan this time of pulse two relative to pulse one, this signal chain moves in time and the electric field moves across the local oscillator. And that gives you that modulation, which gives you the interferogram. It's from this cross term. That's gonna be important. I'll come back to it later. Okay, so we were able to do this. And so this particular thing I'm showing you is 11 carbon chain uh, on SiO2. The head group was a metal carbonyl and the vibrational probe was one of the vibrational uh, vibrations. It was the symmetric vibration of the three CO, uh, COs that are on this rhenium. Okay. So we have this, we clicked it on. Anybody who tells you click chemistry is easy. It's not if you're a physical chemist, that's for sure. But we clicked this head group onto these chains and then we took this data. The problem was, and we got quite nice data. The problem was this data literally took us weeks to get this one decay, almost a month to get decent reproducible data. And uh, you can't, we did a lot of experiments, but it takes weeks per data set, you know, that's a real problem. And uh, the difficulty is that there are very, very few molecules on a monolayer. And so uh, things got a little better because around this time, my group and lots of other groups, uh, we built one of the first ones, but people were building these things up based on work that had been done in the visible was to make a, a, a custo optic modulator do pulse shaping. And so what's good about this is first, uh, as usual, you bring in a pulse and then you beam split it. And one of, when you beam split, a weak, the weaker pulse is going to be uh, the probe pulse. And it's going to take off over like this and go into the monochrometer. The strong pulse gets imaged into the AOM. And by putting in a complicated acousto optic acoustic waveform, you can modulate the single pulse coming in and turn it into two pulses and you can scan those pulses in time uh, with no mechanical moving parts. You can control the phases so you can do phase cycling. So this gets to be a lot more like NMR. You have electronic control of the pulse separations, the time between the pulses, and you can do phase cycling, which is very useful in extracting the data. Okay, so there's lots of great things here. You can electronically very fast scan the pulses, there's this other thing. When you come in with this and you make one pulse into two pulses, the two pulses are collinear. 
and they go, they're the pulse one and pulse two in the pulse sequence. The third pulse comes in at an angle, and because the first two pulses were collinear, the echo comes out collinear with the third pulse, and so you send in the echo in the third pulse. What the third pulse then does after the sample, it acts as the local oscillator, and it's called self-heterodyne. I didn't mention it, but when you're doing those boxcar experiments where you bring in a separate local oscillator, that local oscillator doesn't have a well-defined, I mean, it has a well-defined, you don't know what it is, the phase relationship between the echo and the local oscillator. And there's all sorts of complicated numerical post data processing things that allow you to pull out the correct absorptive uh, 2DIR spectrum. Here it happens automatically. It's called self-heterodyne because the third pole stimulates the echo, emission of the echo, and then heterodynes it. The phase is always perfect. You always get a purely absorptive spectrum and everything works out really nicely. Okay, so there's other things you can do. You can work in what's called the rotating frame by using uh, phase tricks rather than taking a pulse every three femtoseconds, if you look at the time scale of this interferogram, you can effectively shift the vibrational frequency. It's as if the vibration goes from 2,500 wave numbers down to 100 wave numbers. And now you can take a point every 100 femtoseconds instead of every three femtoseconds. That saves a lot of time. You get these beautiful interferograms. You get the same information. So all of this is really, really good. And uh, it took us from four weeks to take data to less than one week to get one of these data sets on a monolayer. The reason why it wasn't even better is there's this problem. You need the local oscillator. It's self-heterodyned. Uh, it amplifies the signal and also gives you the interferogram, which allows you to do the Fourier transforms. And as I mentioned before, the signal is actually this cross term 2LS, but you also have the local oscillator square term. So when you bring in your pulse three to make the echo, it's real big. And so this term L squared is really, really big. And then the signal is not really, really big. So the cross term is really, really small. And what you're trying to look at is the modulation, this cross term on top of this great big signal. And when you do this in the boxcar geometry, you have the ability to reduce the local oscillator. So without changing the signal. So the signal is determined by these three pulses. So I can reduce the local oscillator that makes L squared go down as the square of the local oscillator E field. Uh, but the local oscillator only goes down linearly so that you can make this term relatively bigger relative to L squared and increase the modulation. OK. The problem is, when you do this wonderful thing with pulse shaping, the third pulse stimulates the echo. So the signal is proportional to the size of the third pulse. And it's also the local oscillator. If I turn down the third pulse, that reduces the local oscillator, but it also reduces the signal the same amount. You can't change the ratio of the signal to the local oscillator. The net result is you get a very, 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 very small modulation. And that's why we only got down to one week from three weeks or four weeks for the data because while there were all these wonderful things from the pulse shaping spectrometer, we could not control the local oscillator size without changing the signal. You couldn't win by turning down the local oscillator because it turned down the signal just as much. Okay, so this is, okay, I don't know. I have a little panel here. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> uh, under there it says, what to do? Okay, so what should we do? We came up with this method, and it's got this rather uh, long name. It's the Near Brewster's Angle Reflection Geometry for Monolayers and Thin Films. OK, it's this geometry. So here's the thing you have to know. When you have a monolayer or a very, very thin film, like a film that's 100 nanometers or 50 nanometers, some very thin film, 
Normally, when you bring your beams in, so here's the pump beam, that's really two pulses. Here's the probe. The signal takes off in the forward direction. And this is what we were looking at in all previous experiments. We always look in the forward direction. But when you create a polarization in the monolayer or in uh, the, uh, a thin film, you not only have a signal propagating in this direction, you have a signal propagating exactly in what would be the reflection direction for pulse three. Okay, so the signal takes off in two directions. This doesn't happen in a thick sample because it only happens that so that you, in the forward direction, you always get constructive interference from every plane of the sample. But in the, re, in the reflection direction, you don't get constructive interference. There's phase shifts from different layers. But if you've got a monolayer, you don't have to worry about any phase shifts. And if you've got a very, very thin film, the number of layers is so small that you don't kill the signal. So for thin films and monolayers, you get a signal in the reflection direction. So here's the big deal. The probe also reflects right along with it. So you still have your local oscillator, but of course the reflection is much weaker. And if you go do this as P polarized and you get near Brewster's angle, you can make the reflection as small as you want to. That doesn't change the signal. Pulse three comes in and produces the polarization that makes the signal but you can reduce the reflection of pulse three, which is the local oscillator. And all of a sudden, by doing this reflection geometry, you have control of the local oscillator relative to the signal again. And it looks like this. So in the transmission mode, now this is plotting the percent modulation, which is what we care about. And this again is the symmetric mode. This is this data stuff I showed you before. It's a monolayer. Uh, C11 with this head group. Okay, so when we do it in transmission, we have something like 0.05 modulation, okay? But as you get closer and closer to Brewster's angle, the reflection gets smaller and smaller. So the local oscillators turn down without changing the signal and your percent modulation goes way up. So rather than this being the signal, you can have this be the signal. Uh, for e &M reasons, when you cross Brewster's angle, the sign of the signal changes. So you can be on any side of Brewster's angle. So here's the signal in transmission, and here's the signal near Brewster's angle. And all of a sudden we're in business. We can increase the signal by a factor of 50. Of course, if you increase the signal by 50, if you've got random fluctuations, you increase you reduce the length of time it takes the data by 50 squared. So all of a sudden you can get really great data really fast. Okay, and this is shows that we know how to do ENM. We calculated the signal and this is what happens as you approach Brewster's angle. And then this is when you jump across Brewster's angle. So instead of in transmission after averaging forever getting this sort of ugly data, uh, this is what you get in a very short time uh, when you do it with this near Brewster reflection geometry. And this and this, this is what happens when you cross Brewster's angle, the sign of the data changes. Okay, you can also do this on thin films. They have to be very thin. The rule of thumb is less than about a fifth of the wavelength because you'll still get constructive interference. In the forward direction, if you have a thick sample, you get as much constructive as destructive interference and uh, I'm sorry, in reflection. So you can't do this if you have a thick sample, but for a thin film or a monolayer, this thing works great. And okay, so now uh, water at the air, uh, water interface for a thin film. Well, actually, I'm sorry, a monolayer. What, this is one of these Langmuir monolayers I'll talk about in a second. So we were lucky enough to look in the literature and one of the sort of standard things people make Langmuir Blodgett films out or that's been studied a lot is this thing. And once again, it was almost the same thing we studied when we, uh, we had to make this stuff, but when we would make this stuff and put it on SiO2 or gold monolayers, it's got rhenium tricarbonyl chloride and uh, phenanthrolene. And then you click it onto this long chain and you've got this surfactant and this is gonna go at the water 
and we use the symmetric stretching mode of the CO stretches as our vibrational probe. Now, we wanted to compare this. Of course, the whole point is this sits at the interface because the COs are polar enough that they go, I'll talk about this, they make hydrogen bonds with water. Of course, this long alkyl chain doesn't want to be in the water, and so it sticks up and out, and what you end up with is a monolayer, and what we use is the monolayer right at the interface, these COs stretch as the probe. We wanted to compare it to what you see in bulk water, so we made this thing where it's the exact same, if you will, vibrational probe, except now it's got uh, two, uh, it's got dicarboxylates and that solubilizes it. So we can dissolve this in bulk water and we have this at the air water interface. And this is this thing I showed you, this comes out of uh, simulations we did, uh, uh, a very good uh, postdoc I had, uh, Yang Li Wang, he, he did simulations of this stuff. Also in the literature, this stuff had been studied, was this sort of phase diagram. You know, when you, you, you make, use one of these langmuir blodge troughs and you change the compression, if you will, and you change the area of the head group and the system will go through different things, what they call liquid compact, liquid expanded and so forth. There's down here is random. And so I'm gonna show you data on two, we did it on a bunch of these. By the way, we got our own Langmuir Blodgett trough and we reproduced this stuff that was in the literature. We wanted to do that to make sure we knew what we were doing and also that the literature stuff was correct. And so this is where it's really quite expanded. Even here, that's quite a bit of room for the head groups. And uh, when you do this, what you do is you dissolve the surfactant in chloroform and then you just put a drop of chloroform on the water with the right number of head groups. And then the chloroform evaporates and it just leaves this. I mean, we didn't think this up. This is all very, very well known in the literature. So I'll show you, they didn't know about it quite as well as they thought they did. Uh, and this, uh, 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 when the chloroform evaporates, you're left with one of these Langmuir uh, monolayers. Okay, so the way we did, of course, this is water. So we had this in a pan uh, uh, and it had to be horizontal, which has all sorts of issues all by itself. And so what we would do is bring in the pump pulse, bring in the pump pulse, and then we would look at the signal reflected off the surface of the water, just like I was discussing before. So now I have to tell you how much we know about water in a pan. Uh, so we did this and we set it up and after you know aligning everything and you know, so forth and, and uh, getting everything worked and getting the beam directed into the detectors, we saw a fabulous signal. I mean, it was really, uh, it was remarkably great, strong, good signal because we're doing this near Brewster's angle. And then over five minutes, the signal just got weaker and weaker and weaker and went away. So we went, oh, that's bad. So we lined it up again and there was this really, really strong signal. And then we watched as over about five minutes, the signal just got weaker and weaker and went away. And finally we realized, oh, water evaporates. And you know, what was happening was as the water would evaporate, the level of the water in this pan would go down. And what that would do, of course, the reflection would just move down and the reflection would just move right off the detector. Then we'd put it back on the detector and the reflection would just move right off of the detector again. So we looked in the literature and we found everybody but us knew about this. Um, and, but they did, everybody in the literature does something that I wouldn't do, I considered it wrong. What they would do is they would have a motorized, uh, you know, translation stage and the pan on it. And as the water evaporated, they would slowly move the pan up they weren't doing 2D IR, but whatever signal they were looking at, maybe it was spectro you know, linear spectroscopy or whatever, they would just uh, keep the level at the right point. The problem with that is with water, when you put this in this pan, you literally get a meniscus that's like a millimeter above the edge of the pan. And as the water evaporates, the meniscus changes. And the meniscus goes from a positive meniscus to a negative meniscus. And I went, well, gee, what makes us think the surfactants are gonna be the same as, you know, the structure as the meniscus is changing shape. 
So instead, what we did was I said, I didn't do it. My people did it. I said, oh, you have to do this. So they figured out how to do it. We got a computer controlled syringe pump. This pan is made out of Teflon and they didn't know how to get the water in. This is where I come in. I say, just get a hype, just get a syringe and shove the needle right through the Teflon pan. It'll seal, which it did. And so we just stuck a syringe down near the pot bottom. And then we brought in, in addition to the IR pulses, a diode laser into a quad detector. Quad detector goes into computer, computer goes into the syringe pump, and the syringe pump just pumps in water as the water evaporates. It just watches it and just keeps this level. We could probably do better, but we kept the level to within like two microns, plus or minus a micron. Since the beams are 100 microns and they hit a detector element that's 500 microns, uh, as long as we maintain this within a couple microns, we were fine. This is what it looks like. Here's the pan of water. Here's the needle from the syringe pump just stuck right inside the edge of the pan. Uh, here's the syringe pump pumping water into the pan. And believe it or not, this was <laughs> initially, this was quite a problem for us, but uh, we got it to work okay. Okay, so here's what it looks like. We make really, really beautiful data. So we call this thing TRIF-18. It's trichloro, I'm sorry, tricarbonyl rhenium phenanthylene on an 18 carbon chain. And we can't say that, the real name. So we call it TRIF-18. So here's a monolayer. This was at the low density, this 90 angstrom squared per head group. And you can see we're just getting beautiful data off of a monolayer. And so this is at 0.6 picoseconds, and this is at 15 picoseconds. And of course, you can see the change in shape of the spectrum. And it's that change in shape that gives you the frequency frequency correlation function using this uh, centerline slope method to uh, look at the data. OK, so we get beautiful data. So, But first, this is the the water soluble version. So this is the same thing, except it doesn't have the long alkyl chain and it's got a dicarboxylate. And I, we didn't take, the pulses are longer in this system. So we didn't take the real short water data. And what we saw was this first, this is remember in bulk water. Uh, uh, actually, this is wrong. It shouldn't say HOD. I'm sorry, the HOD number in bulk water is 1.7. Remember, we're looking at the symmetric stretch of the rhenium tricarbonyl. So we get 1.5 picoseconds. But we've looked at lots of other uh, small molecules, small ions in water like selenium, uh, 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 CN, the CN stretch, and just CN minus and BH4 minus and other things. You get numbers like 1.5 picoseconds and actually that's plus or minus 0.1. This is plus or minus 0.1. We studied this guy in detail in water and Ward Thompson at the University of Kansas did really detailed simulations. And what you're looking at when you look at these things is you're looking at the hydrogen bond rearrangement, just like when you're looking at bulk water. Okay, so our probe gives you 1.5, but then there's also this long thing that we don't see in normal bulk water when we look at HOD. So this is what we see when we look at the surfactant. Rather than 1.5, we see 3.1 picoseconds. And this 3.1 picoseconds is the hydrogen bond rearrangement of water right where the probe are the you know, symmetric CO stretch of the head group. So you're only looking at the water right at the interface. You're looking at the hydrogen bond rearrangements right at the interface. Remember, it's all of those waters that are hydrogen bonded to the water that's hydrogen bonded to the COs that are giving you the dynamics. So this is interesting that it, it surprised me. I would have thought it would have slowed down more, but the water hydrogen bond dynamics for like the layer of water right at the interface uh, slows down about a factor of two compared to bulk water. Okay, but this other number here, which I haven't told you what it is yet, this 5.8 picoseconds, it goes to 42 picoseconds going from bulk water uh, to being right at the interface. And we figured out through simulations, 
and some ideas and thinking about it, what this thing is. And here's what it is. When you have tricarbonyl, so this is the rhenium, here, here's the phenanthrolene. Uh, okay, so, um, uh, and uh, so here's the tricarbonyl. There are three carbonyls. Each one can make two hydrogen bonds to water. So here's two hydrogen bonds. Here's one hydrogen bond. Here's some more of the network. This is supposed to show more network. So it turns out you can make no hydrogen bonds, one, two, three, four, five, or six hydrogen bonds. You can have up to six hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bond to this thing, or down to zero. The most likely is three, which may not be surprising, one hydrogen bond to each carbonyl. But you get quite a few with two or four. This comes out of simulations. And the thing is, all of these different hydrogen bonds, whether it's zero to six, are within the inhomogeneously broadened line uh, of the symmetric stretch of the tricarbonyl. And what you get is you get interchanges. So you go from three hydrogen bonds to four hydrogen bonds, or three hydrogen bonds to two hydrogen bonds. Or you might, at time g equals zero, have four hydrogen bonds, and you go to three hydrogen bonds. And that causes spectral diffusion, because these are the frequencies that came out of the simulations. And what you see is the frequencies, depending on whether you have three, four, two hydrogen bonds, you get different frequencies. So actually forming and breaking, changing the number of hydrogen bonds that you have to the tricarbonyls, uh, rhenium tricarbonyls, that is a source of spectral diffusion. And that's much, much slower. It's much, much harder for it to do this at the interface. And that's because when you're right at the interface, when you break one of these hydrogen bonds, you're going to lose a hydrogen bond to the carbonyl, but you've got to form a hydrogen bond in water. The wa this, this hydroxyl that lets go of this carbonyl, it wants to make a hydrogen bond to another water. And what this shows is this is much more difficult. This hydrogen bond rearrangement, not water-water rearrangements, but water to something sitting right at the interface. It's hard for water to make those hydrogen re rearrangements because when it breaks this hydrogen bond, it has to form a hydrogen bond in this layer right at the interface. And what the data shows is this is much, much slower than if you're just in bulk water. Okay. Now I have to show you how weird it becomes. Uh, this is what we've been looking at. There's one peak I've been showing you, and this is what we call the main peak. But it turned out, and at first it really confused us, we kept doing this over and over again. When you look at the data, sometimes you see one peak, sometimes you see three peaks. This is the main peak, that's that peak. We call this the blue peak because it's at higher frequency. We call this the red peak because it's at lower frequencies. Sometimes you see two peaks. Sometimes you see the other two peaks. So you may see one peak, three peaks, these two peaks, or those two peaks. You always see the main peak. These other two peaks come and go, okay? And uh, we took this data by taking all the data and sorting it out so that we could combine like data sets that had three peaks. It gets even stranger. So if you have three peaks, if you look, we developed this uh, technique some time ago. It's, it's chemical, 2DIR chemical exchange spectra. It's like an NMR, except about 10 to the 10th time faster, where you can look at chemical exchange. You see the growth of these off diagonal peaks. What that means, as you can see, and by the way, the amplitudes are changing. We always normalize to the biggest peak. So the reason why these peaks look like they got smaller to, than this peak is because we're always making the biggest peak one. Uh, so these have different peaks. The lifetime of the symmetric CO stretch is different depending on which ones of what we call different structures in this thing. And what this shows is that the structures are very rapidly interconverting. Uh, so like uh, we met, we you can determine this by the growth of the off diagonal peaks that you have like 40 picosecond time scale for like this blue peak to turn into the main peak or the main peak to turn into a red peak. 
And that's what you get out of these things. So this is pretty amazing. What you have is not one structure, but three structures. And these structures come and go. And these are from configurational changes of the lipid itself causing the frequency of this carbonyl, tricarbonyl, the symmetric stretch to change. And these interchange, but they also come and go. And they come and go on quite slow time scales. OK, so at this point, we went, well, how long does this thing actually last, or this thing actually last? We always see the main peak. But what we found was, of course, sometimes we only see one peak, and sometimes we see three peaks, and these things are coming and going. So what we did was we got to the point where we could take a 2D IR spectrum at one time, TW is 0.6 picoseconds, in eight seconds. Now, this wasn't great data like this. This is averaging a lot of data that has three peaks. But we could take good enough 2D IR data in eight, peak, eight seconds to determine whether there were three peaks, two peaks, or one peak. And we actually took 5,000 spectra and then wrote a whole bunch of software so people didn't have to look at it at hand. And it just went through and it went, how many peaks do you have? Do you have the red peak? Do you have the blue peak? Do you have the main peak? And what you see is they, these things come and go. Like right here, this is, by the way, you always have the main peak. This is zero. This guy was offset. The blue peak was offset in this plot by two units, just so you could see it. Like right here is where you don't have any of the blue peak. And over here, you don't have any of the red peak. Or over here, you don't have any of the red peak. So what you're seeing is these things coming and going. And over, you know, this is, this is 70 minutes. This is one, we did this for hours and hours. This is one 70 minute stretch of these things coming and going. And here's the interesting thing. Remember, we're looking at a 100 micron spot. So if this thing goes away, if this blue peak goes away, it means either it's completely gone in 100 microns or its concentration in 100 microns gets so low that we can't detect it. Even when we have real good signal to noise, this thing will go away. So you're actually getting macroscopic fluctuations of the structure of this Langmuir film, and it goes on and on. It occurs over hours. After three and a half hours, three and a half hours, the red peak, the one that was here, is just gone. This is just all zeros. The main peak gets more stable. The th this third peak, the blue peak, is still coming and going. But it's really interesting. So after three and a half hours, you're heading towards some kind of equilibration of the structure on the surface, and you no longer see the structures that give rise to what we call the red peak. It's just gone, and it doesn't come back. OK, so, uh, so when people put down these Langmuir, Blodgett, Langmuir films with chloroform, and you know, you wait a couple minutes. The chloroform evaporates in 30 seconds. You wait a couple minutes, and you go, okay, now I can start taking data. The structure of that film is changing for hours. So I'll show you how many hours it's changing with to finish. So what we did was we sat at one time and we watched this thing. And what we would do is uh, we took the uh, the main peak, and we would sort the data so that we were looking at the main peak and see this is from zero to 900 minutes. So that's 15 hours. So we sat there and watched this thing for 15 hours, pumping water in all the time to keep the level within two microns. And here's what you see. What we're looking now at is the center line slope. We did it for both the uh, higher density and lower density. And we're seeing it change. So you start out at short time, and this is the low density data. And what you see is, remember, the shape of this thing is determined by the structure. And we're now not looking at we're not looking at fast picosecond structural fluctuations. We'll make this thing look over picoseconds. We're looking only at one particular time. And we're watching it change shape over hours. 
And what you see here is it changes shape, it changes shape, changes shape, and then it levels off and starts, stops changing shape. This is just sort of arbitrary. We picked a point where, okay, it sort of stopped changing shape uh, sort of at the knee here. And so for the low density thing, it took over eight hours for the structure of this Langmuir film to stop changing. For the higher density, it took about five and a half hours. Well, this is sort of the knee, pretty much a little over five and a, somewhat over five and a half hours for this structure to keep stop changing. So this is a message to all those people who are probably not in this group who study Langmuir films. If they look 10 minutes after they make the film and they think they're looking at this thing in equilibrium, they're not. You've got structural evolution over hours. So in these experiments, we were able to look at 2D IR to look at structural fluctuations happening on picoseconds and tens of picoseconds all the way out to structural changes out to 15 hours. So that's why we say this is ultra fast to ultra slow 2D IR experiments. Okay, so finally to finish up, what I tell you, well, first I showed you a little bit about uh, what 2D IR tells you about the dynamics of water. They're very fast, local length fluctuations, and then there's a complete hydrogen bond rearrangement. But then to be able to look really well at uh, monolayers, and we've also used this method a lot on very thin films of perovskites and very, very thin films of room temperature ionic liquids. It really works very well. So uh, we use this Brewster's angle reflection geometry, which allows us to control the local oscillator. And all of a sudden that gives us all the advantages of pulse shaping, plus the ability to control the local oscillator, making it possible to do experiments on uh, monolayers and thin films. So we looked at this, you know, air water interface and we found it's surprising to me anyway, that the dynamics compared to bulk water uh, of these water hydrogen bond fluctuations only slowed down by about a factor of two right at the interface, uh, uh, right at the surfactant interface. And then uh, we also showed that you can see at the higher density anyway, multiple structures that come and go on you know, minutes sort of, many minutes sort of time scales. And that means you're getting macroscopic uh, structural fluctuations, a big hunk of the film, because we look at a hundred micron diameter spot. If you know it was just very local, this thing was coming and going, you know, on average, you would see it all the time. But for it to go away completely, either it's really completely gone, or at least the concentration of that structure has dropped so low that we can't detect, detect it. And then we saw that for both the low and high density monolayers, uh, the structure evolves over many, many hours, you know, uh, a little faster for the high density, five and a half hours for the lower density, eight hours. And only after that, do you find that the structure as measured by the spectral diffusion measured by the structural fluctuations are the same. There's structural fluctuations, of course, but the nature of the structural fluctuations takes hours before they stop changing. And of course, the nature of the structural fluctuations change because the structure of the Langmuir film is changing. Okay, finally, uh, I had a bunch of really good people who did this stuff. Uh, Jun Nishida, he came up with this reflection mode experimental method and theory. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, Chang Yan, Joe Tamaz, uh, these guys did the experiments and Young Li Wang did the simulations that helped us really understand what was going on. And this work was supported by uh, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Well, thank you, Mike, for the great talk. No questions. Everything was um, There are a few questions. I think uh, Carlos froze for a second, so I'll go ahead and get the questions started um, while, he, while we wait for him. 
So um, thank you again, Professor Fayer, for such a great presentation. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, I'll read the first one from Milomir Suvira. Um, and he mentions that people argue that the gas liquid interface is charged due to charged hydroxyl groups. Have you considered using cationic or anionic surfactants in some of these measurements? Because the surface molecule used at the interface is neutral with charge in the book. Is this a fair comparison? Yeah. Okay. I have to tell you, we not only talked about this, we made surfactants, but also a really interesting thing with just to start throwing salt in the solution, right? And to look at just what we looked at, which is to take that probe, which is soluble in bulk water with a bunch of salt, whatever kind of salt you like, you know, uh, you know, potassium bromide, whatever, and then look at the same thing at the interface. So I don't know what you guys think. I thought this stuff was so interesting, both the ability to, uh, we also actually ma made work, this got tricky working with some people to use charged surfactant things that also had a probe. We need a probe right at the interface and a charge. So I wrote a proposal on it and NSF didn't think that this was, I shouldn't say NSF. I should say whoever was on the panel that looked at this thing, which I thought was the most interesting, greatest thing ever from looking at the fast dynamics and it had all this stuff, charged surfactant, salts in the water, uh, just all sorts of things in this thing. And also all this slow dynamics of the, of the layers themselves. So this was the one and only one study done of this kind. Maybe somebody else can pick it up, uh, but uh, I should probably write another proposal and try and get funding for this. But so we did this and it just stopped. And we had, we actually built a better, fancier system to do it better and then to no avail, I didn't do it. So yes, that's a very good question. We'd love to answer those things. I think it's it, there, this is a really good way to address a whole bunch of issues that happen. Now it's not air water, we've got a surfactant sitting there. Uh, and if the surfactant could get shorter, we also, want, we also started looking at different surfactant chain lengths and all this stuff. So remember, this is not air water, this is surfactant water interface. Okay, I guess I'll ask the next next question. Uh, my internet connection went out for, for a minute when I was asking the first question. So coming back to Andre Tokmakov's question, uh, the question was, what problems arise if you use the shaper in the boxcars geometry in using uh, a local oscillator for heterodyning instead of he self-heterodyning in the pump probe geometry? I'm sorry. So uh, are we talking literally well, if you do real boxcar, you, you have control of the local oscillator, right? Uh, but uh, I think Andre does these beautiful experiments where rather than, maybe the question could be clarified. Uh, he does experiments or has done experiments where he actually uses delay lines, uh, but makes an interferometer where uh, pulse one and two are collinear. And so the echo comes out collinear with pulse three, uh, then again, you have the local oscillator issue. You could use this near Brewster angle thing. Uh, if you're using a pulse shaper in boxcar geometry, there should be, I, I guess I don't know quite how you, you could use two of them or use one of them to move one of the pulses, which you could do. But if you've got control over the local oscillator, this problem goes away. So we got control over the local oscillator by this near Brewster angle trick. Uh, if you have a separate local oscillator, then the problem, problem goes away. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So Thank you. we're not, we weren't, we didn't have enough equipment or clever enough, but this thing, it actually works exceedingly well. So uh, we like it. It's, it's a little, well, the reflection geometry, you know, you got to set up for it. It's a little tricky. It's not really that bad. I mean, you can you can just do it. Yeah. Great, thank you. I think Rodrigo will ask the next one. Yes, this next question come, comes from Gary Yang. 
Um, and the question is, did the force used to prepare the monolayer film have an effect on the time constants, especially for the long time one? And if there's a way of showing that the, the depends of the force or density for the time constants more than just high and low density designations. Okay, so let me tell you how we did this. Although we planned to do what was suggested here. We had a Langmuir blodgett trough and we did do measurements to check the phase diagram. But the way we did this was we just dropped the right amount of surfactant in chloroform. It's in the literature. We actually checked this out ourselves. So this was not done in a Langmuir blodgett trough. We did do uh, uh, different densities. I only showed you two. We did a bunch of them. So I showed you the lowest density and the highest density we did. So we, we it wasn't in a trough. So we didn't we couldn't sit there and like compress it while we're doing the experiment. So the change, the surface density, we start all over again and uh, we just put a drop of chloroform with a different concentration of surfactant. And like I said, we tested this thing in Langmuir blodgett troughs to make sure by doing that, that, that we were doing it right. It's done it, it's in the literature. They say you can do this. By the way, that, that, when we wrote this paper, we got all sorts of grief from one of the referees and the referee said, oh, this isn't real. Everything you're seeing, not, not the short time dynamics, everything you're seeing is because you're picking up contamination from the air. And uh, so we went, well, we had all sorts of reasons to believe we weren't seeing contamination from the air. So it took us a long time, but we built, we went from the thing I showed you to a completely enclosed thing, purged with unbelievable clean air and so forth. And we got exactly the same results. So we finally beat this referee into submission. And I think people think that by having some thing of water out in the air, they see these time dependent changes. It's always attributed to like, you got oil in the air going onto your thing and messing up your layer. I don't think so. We showed it, although we had pretty clean air to begin with, but uh, yeah. So I just wanted to mention this, there's these issues when you do this Langmuir stuff, people have, to, I think some of it is just, they don't realize and this is the only piece of work that shows it how long it could take a surface to equilibrate. Yeah, so yes. <laughs> in the proposal that wasn't funded was to do this in a Langmuir blodgett trough and you know, be able to change the, the, the pressure density, you know, this thing while doing the experiment. Okay, so like let it equilibrate, change it, watch, you know, things like that, but yeah. Okay, I'll ask the next, next question. And Mike, if you'd like to stop your screen share, um, that way people can see see your your video. Because I think right now we're still doing screen share. I'm sorry, what do you want? Uh, you want to see slides? No, no, if you want to uh, stop the screen share, people can see your video full screen. If I stop the screen share, okay, good. Then I can't go back, I guess I can go back to the slides, yeah. So did I do it? Yeah, yeah, now we can see you. Great. Okay. Um, so the next question is from Eric Bourget. Somebody should ask me a question I get to write on the blackboard so I can jump <laughs> up and write on my blackboard. Right, welcome to use the blackboard if you want. For, um, so the next question is about the curvature um, of the meniscus. So um, at the microscopic scale, meniscus can actually affect monolayers. And Eric Bourget asked uh, whether you see an effect of curvature on your Langmuir trough when you use the, wh whether you see any changes in the dynamics due to the meniscus. And then there's a follow-up question to that, which is, does it matter whether you pump the water in or whether you raise the trough itself? Okay, so on the first question, you, I showed you a picture. We have a really big pan. It's this big, okay? So I don't, I don't, I don't think there's, unlike a little droplet or something where there's a lot of curvature, this thing is pretty much flat until you get to the edge and goes over. We, it, 
we don't get near the edge of the pan. We did hit the middle of the pan in different spots, but it was always in the middle of, I mean, the pan was literally this big, right? And uh, uh, th that was useful for a bunch of reasons. One of the which there wasn't, there was more water in it. Uh, and um, uh, uh, we didn't do a study of that. We did hit the pan in somewhat, you know, near the middle, sort of moved around a little bit. It, that didn't make any difference. We weren't near the edge. When you get near the edge, that's where you see, in a, when you have a really big pan, significant, significant curvature. But I mean, that would be really interesting to look at. Um, see, we, we wanted a nice reflection off of effectively a planar surface. Uh, the spot is non-negligible. So if you had a lot of curvature over the, you know, the 100, 200 microns, the beam, it would act like a lens, right? And that would be bad for us. So we wanted a big pan so that the thing looked quite flat. And from the beam coming out, you could tell it, it, it didn't change its divergence. It, so we were hitting something that was fairly flat. Yeah. OK. Um. Thank you. Uh, this next question comes from Lu Wang. Um, and then the question is whether it would be possible to isotope label some of the COs to get more insight into what structural rearrangements lead to the three peaks that you observe in your data. Um, that's a good idea. Um, let's see. We do have very, very good signal to noise. But of course, when you I add it's you could look at C13, for example, which would not be difficult to do. Uh, I mean, C13O, which would shift it somewhat. We like if you we use C13 label on nitriles, and so I don't know about CO, I don't know the numbers, but if you go from C12 nitrile to C13 nitrile, you get like a 50 55 wave number shift, which is non negligible. These I didn't show you the spectrum, but the lines are only like 10 wave numbers wide. Okay, so you know that would be a significant shift. Of course, if you only label with a very small amount, then the signal goes down. But I mean, you could, uh, we have quite good signal to noise, so you could, you probably could go to 10% would be okay, uh, which would be enough so that you, you would have like one. Uh, Look, we think these, these things are local density fluctuations. Uh, it would take massive simulations to really, because simulating this would be a nightmare. You would need to simulate a macroscopic thing over hours. That doesn't, <laughs> if you talk to one of your simulation friends and you say that, they look at you like you're insane and their eyes glaze over. So it's, it's, Ways of finding it, we were, look, we started looking at this thing with a C14 chain instead of a C18 chain. And we did see multiple structures, but they were different and they changed differently. So I think isotopic labeling and other things, chemical games, uh, you know, I mean, is clever choice of molecules and stuff. By the way, just some of the stuff we had was so interesting that didn't get funded. We also did, just to mention it, a, a very preliminary, we did it though, we could see it, where we went to a low concentration of this same surfactant as the probe in a, a dipomethyl phosphatidylcholine. So in other words, we, 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 we would have, you know, basically a model membrane with low concentration of the same surfactant in dipomethyl phosphatidylcholine, you know, one of the common things that membranes are made out of. So you could use this as a probe of like membrane things and then put cholesterol in it and do proteins in it. You could, you could in principle do all these things. Yes, but NSF was not interested in it. Anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, so yes, I think uh, you're not gonna simulate this. So I think you're gonna have to be clever and look at things with different, uh, 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 chemical ideas of what would pull out information. And let, let me just say, anybody wants to do this, feel free to do it. We're not doing it anytime soon. Uh, 
we're, we're, yes, so we're, you won't be stepping on our toes if somebody wants to pick this up. I'd love to see more work of this done. I think it's really interesting. Thank you, Austin. Next, I'll combine the next two questions, Mike, because they're related. Um, so Mark Kobrak asks the first question, which is that surface tension measurements are known to take several hours to equilibrate. So that is consistent with what you're seeing with the experiment. And the question is, um, do you see if, if you, let's see, is it possible to differentiate between the structure conversion versus migration in and out of the probe region in the, of the focus area? And then um, the other question is from Rich Loomis uh, who asked, how much does the IR spectroscopy affect the long time dynamics that you're measuring? In other words, if you change the fluences, would you see any differences? Yeah. Okay, so we, okay, so first of all, we thought about this. We worried about it a bunch. First, I should mention that the water evaporation is enough that it actually cools the temperature of the pan down a couple of degrees because um, it's got a real big surface area. So we changed, we, okay, so first we calculated, you know, you come in and you're not right on a water resonance, but you know, the water keeps, absor water absorbs everywhere, right? So the water keeps absorbing as you go in and it absorbs over 50, 100 microns in. So we started worrying about the temperature increase and that type of stuff. And uh, so we, you know, calculated in the, it's the thermal diffusion and stuff. And that made us think it wasn't going to matter. But then we did a, a, a intensity study. Now you can, as we know, you can only do this. We had pretty good signal to noise. So we could cut the intensity, you know, by a third, by half, by two thirds, and still get reasonable signal to noise. And that, that didn't change anything. So uh, we, we, we don't think we're having thermal effects because, you know, the amount of absorption in the monolayer is really, really small, right? The main absorption is going 100 microns into the water because even though you're not on a strong water transition, water absorbs, and you know you're absorbing that beam as you go into that pan of water, and uh, so we really we worried about it, and we changed, you know, we calculated it, but we also uh, just lowered the power, and we didn't see a change. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. I'll take uh, the next one uh, comes from Franz Geiger. Uh, and the question was, what are the prospects of developing this approach for a buried interface where dispersion would be a challenge? I'm sorry, uh, what kind of? In oh. A buried interface where you would have to fight against dispersion. Okay, okay, so. Um, you need, so. Let me, let me just mention something, on a different thing that's the same idea. Uh, when we've done a whole many, many, we have a, several papers published, nice papers, on very thin films of room temperature ionic liquids. And we take a calcium fluoride substrate and we, func uh, I'm sorry, we put a SiO2 layer on it or a gold layer, but SiO2 and we functionalize it, okay? And then we spin and we functionalize with something that will hold the room temperature ionic liquid. It actually looks like a room temperature ionic liquid. And then we put spin coat on from, we've gone down as low as 15 nanometers up to a few hundred nanometers. We have an air interface at top, on the top. So one side is up against a solid interface and the other side is an air interface. And we really, really wanted to, we haven't done it yet, we're working on it, to look at both, both solid interfaces. So here's the problem. So that would be in some sense a buried interface. You'd have calcium fluoride and then you would have uh, you know, an interface at the calcium fluoride. But the problem is you need a reflection. So and when you have a very, very thin film, that is, it, 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 when you go through it, it virtually, essentially doesn't have an inter, in, index of refraction. It's the substrate that counts. So what we realized was we weren't going to get any reflection because uh, you basically would have calcium fluoride thin, 
calcium fluoride. But then what we realized was if we went calcium fluoride, thin layer barium fluoride, barium fluoride has enough difference in inter uh, index from calcium fluoride that you'd get this very weak reflection. You wouldn't even have to do it at Brewster's angle because the reflection would just be weak. Okay, so here's the deal. If you have a buried interface, and let's say you have your probe molecule right at the interface, there's no reason why you can't look at it, but you need an in, if you're gonna use this technique where you reduce the local oscillator by reflection, it wouldn't have to be at Brewster's angle, but if the, if the interface was between two liquids that had at least some difference in inter, index of refraction, you would get reflection right off of that interface and if you're, you did something so that your probe molecules were at that interface, you could certainly do it. But let's say you had a liquid-liquid interface and the two liquids had the same index of refraction or virtually the same index of refraction. There would, you wouldn't get a reflection. And so, uh, okay. But if you had that on a substrate, you would get a reflection, you could be okay. But if you had two thick layers, uh, but you only and you but you had the two liquid layers and they had they don't have to have a big change in index but they have to have a different index so you get a reflection and if for some reason you could make your probe be right at the interface uh, you you would see you would see that so you need different index you need the probe at the interface remember this is not an interface selective technique if I put the probe in two thick, two thick liquid layers, I may see a signal in reflection, but I'm going to see that signal going into the layer some significant distance. So when we look at RTIL thin films, we purposely want to see the whole film. So we put down a 100 nanometer layer, and we see the 100 nanometer layer. But if you want just interface, the probe's got to be at the interface and you've got to have a difference in index of refraction. Great. Um, so I think we'll ask one more question, Mike, uh, and then we're going to go to a session with just students where we'll enable the students to unmute themselves. So the last question is um, from William Jeffries that asked that the CLS did not decay to zero in this measurement. So um, the question is whether the amplitude of that long time scale offset changes as the film is equilibrating? Oh, you know, we did not look at, I'm trying to think. Okay, here's what we did do. We didn't go all the way to the end, but we did, so the CLS, which is looking at the water fluctuations, the, the 10 pico, the tens of picosecond stuff, we did that. Now remember, it takes a while to measure that. But what we could do is we could take data at early time. When I say early time, I mean like in the first 30 minutes or something like that, or an hour. And then we took data at like the fourth hour. And then we took data at the eighth hour. I mean, you sort of do it all at one time, right? And I, I just want to, oh, I didn't answer another question about running out of the spot size. I'll come back to that. So what, what we saw no change within our signal to noise, we saw no change. So what that's saying is uh, we are seeing things that are not affecting the way the water molecules are behaving relative to the, to the carbonyls. Uh, what we're seeing, and we, I'm sorry, again, we only did that on that main peak because that's the thing that stays there all the time. It doesn't disappear, right? And when the other peaks are there, you also have the complication of the chemical exchange and off diagonal peaks growing in and so forth. So when I'm saying this, we looked at that main peak, which is always there, and we looked at it at, remember, I can't look at it in eight seconds to get good data to actually analyze the CLS and do a TW dependence. I, I, I have to do this over you know some range of times, but since I got hours, I could change it. We didn't see a difference. Also, I'm sorry, there's a question of stuff leaving the spot. 
that that can't be it because we're in a big pan. And if I had some if I had some stuff that was in a certain structure and it moved out of my spot, just as much stuff would move into the spot. I mean, it, it, we think it's an in equilibrium. This is the thing we think. There's really a macroscopic change, much bigger than our 100 micron spot, that I don't know if it's the entire pan is fluctuating or millimeters fluctuating, but whatever it is, when we look at 100 microns, like I said, within our signal to noise, we'll see two of those peaks come and go. And when they go, they go completely, when I say completely, completely at our level of detection, which is pretty good. So they go down at least by many factors of 10, right? I can't tell you if they go to zero. I can tell you that they get really, really, if they are still there, their concentration is so low, we can't detect them. So the best I can say is they go from really low concentration to much, much higher concentration. Maybe they go, but they do it over a macroscopic distance scale, which is really sort of amazing. So. Great, thank you. Okay, um, that was the last question. So what we're going to do next is I'm gonna go ahead and stop the YouTube live stream. And we're going to ask all professors in the audience to please sign out so we can have 